Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Today, two very special guests, dear friends of mine, Kate Clinton and Irva Shivad. Kate is without a doubt my favorite faith-based, funny as heck, political humorist. Her repertoire of commentaries, comedy shows, books and appearances is legion. And she's kicking off her I don't know how many season in Provincetown this month. Over Shivad, her longtime partner, is a community organizer, an attorney who's been a leader in the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans movement for 30 years, former executive director of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. She's worked in philanthropy and now in a think tank she started at Columbia University. She's a veteran, you could say, of the push for change in the streets and in the suites and on the pages. Her she, most recent she, book is Irresistible Revolution, Confronting Race and Class and the Assumptions of LGBT Politics. It is not often enough that the two agree to give interviews together. <laughs> I consider this an enormous treat. What do I want to talk about? Everything. But among the questions these two provoke, the obvious one is revolution and revolutionaries. What makes them irresistible? Let's talk about that and the delicious, difficult work of making change and making family and community. Three things these two are great at. Mm. Kate Clinton and Ova Shivad. Welcome. Thanks. Wow. I do want to talk about everything. So where to begin? First, I guess, thanks for doing this. You're welcome. And why are you so reluctant to do interviews together? We don't like to jinx it. Isn't it? Every what, the interview or the years together? Ago, no, the well, that's a great <laughs> well, that's <laughs> I thought of that. <laughs> no, years ago, when, when uh, couples were coming out and, you know, proudly saying that they were together, and then two weeks later they'd be broken up. So we thought, eh, let's not do that. Well, I don't think yeah, we, we just work. We just thought that, 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 I mean, we've always acknowledged our relationship to each other, but we just didn't do the couple thing. It just wasn't our public um it didn't I, I didn't appeal to me publicly all right so to heck with all of that it's all going to change here right here right now <laughs> <laughs> i feel like breaking up no no no, sorry, no. Okay. now now good for it <laughs> let's start with if you leave me i'm coming too I know. <laughs> <laughs> after a certain point in a relationship you, i mean that's the rule that's not even a rule it's just what it is yeah that's what happens it's like do okay honey want. do what you want <laughs> but I'll be right here. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to say, I learned quite a lot about the two of you from your book, Irv. Um, yeah. Including that when you first came out to your father, he was relieved. Why? <laughs> <laughs> well, truly, I think he um, knew that I was politically a lefty and a radical. And he, was, he feared that I had gotten involved in like the weather underground or something. So he was quite relieved that it was just merely the gay movement, I think. <laughs> drew you into it? What, what inspired you to get involved in politics? At that point, it was cultural politics. You were involved very much in the women's music scene and other things. Well, I think I got involved in the 70s because um, as, a, as a child in the 60s, I mean, I was, I was 12 in 1970. And, but I, the, the context was so alive and social movements were everywhere you looked if you were paying attention to the news as I was. I was always interested in politics, so I paid attention and I read the paper as a little nerd. And <laughs> really? <laughs> I really was. I was a little nerd and I read the paper with thick Coke bottle glasses and long Indian hair. And I, I was drawn to um, those who were anti in the anti-war movement, in the civil rights movement. But of course I was too young to be any part of anything in the substate New York town where I was growing up. But at school, at college, I got involved in the anti-apartheid movement in, as part of that student wave of activism that was working on divestment. And I really feel that that and exposure to the women's liberation movement mm. um, on campus and in books and pamphlets and the bookstores and made me, just changed my, my life. It, it made me want to change the world. It made me uh, have an outlet for the sense of um, outrage that I think I always had. Your experience was a little different, Kate. You were going to college in a Jesuit college in upstate New York thinking you were going to go into a lifetime career of teaching. Yes, yes. You did teach for a long time. I did. I taught for eight years, high school English, and I, I'm a triumph. I am like the product of the women's movement. I came from a very, very middle class, middle class values, you know, you didn't make waves, and very Catholic, very fundamentalist Catholic, 
<laughs> and, and, you know, I got the news. I got the news about feminism, and that was the religion I wanted and had longed for. And so I really feel like I came from a very conservative background and just thought, oh, my God, this is for me. You were a Republican, right, at one point? My now we're really coming out. I know. I know, really. Well, I mean, my mom, I remember her as a Republican. My, she was just so disappointed that Richard Nixon had done that. I remember her in the summers iron, ironing shirts down in the basement and listening to the Watergate hearings and just being like, oh my, and stop. And my father would go to work that, that summer. I remember walk to, watching him go out to work and he would have like these brown triangles where my mother's iron had stopped because <laughs> she just couldn't believe that Richard Nixon had done that. Those That's hearings where were from. mesmerizing. So he didn't just erase tapes. He also left like, <laughs> marks dad. on his shirts. Yeah. <laughs> I have a theory, but tell me if it plays out, um, that the personal really is political mm -hmm. and that there are certain things that are draw one uh, draw us to one another that aren't so different from the things that draw us to movements and the work that we do. So to try and prove my theory right, l let me ask you. I mean, Kate, starting with you. What was it that, that drew you to Irv in the first place? Was there something that she said? I had gone to a conference. I had been talked into going to a conference. I flew all night to get there. I'd done a show in Denver, flew all night, got to this conference. And I thought, oh my God, it was just awful. I thought I'd made a horrible mistake. <laughs> it was just like hot air. Like I couldn't believe it. And I don't do well in crowds. And finally, someone said, I would just like to make three points. And I thought, oh my God, that's and I looked, and it was her. And she did have three points. Well, so gravity, of, memory? Uh, just brilliant, exciting. And brilliant and exciting. Yeah. What about you, Irv? I thought she was really hot. <laughs> and I just um, was drawn to her immediately. And then I found out she had a really brilliant mind, too. <laughs> So is That's this just a pretty face. <laughs> so is no, this proving my theory or not? I'm not I, sure. I don't know if it's proving your theory because, I mean, I knew of Kate reputationally, but I didn't know her work and I didn't really know her. So um, it was through getting to know each other after falling in bed with each other, which is how, you know, used gay, the gay world used to work. Like the whole world used to work. You slept together and then you got to know each other. <laughs> <laughs> the values that draw us to each other and that allow us to continue to be excited about being in a relationship with each other are connected to the political values that each of us has and we share. Um, so I, I mean I think you're right in the sense in terms of friendships, in terms of what attracts me to people, it's similar to yeah. what attracts me to movements. But mm. on the other, I don't think you can make a, I don't, I wouldn't make the perfect comparison because lust is a, a very different uh, patina well, you're on right. politics. <laughs> but let's seize on that word excitement, maybe. Because I do think there's a common thread of excitement. Something excites you in a person and something excites you in a movement. Sometimes what excites you is the vision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you about that. I mean, Kate, you, you said you were, a, you know, score one for the women's movement. <laughs> what was it about that movement that excited you? And what did you think it was that you were part of. I really felt I was a part of history, immediately. I felt that what we were doing was really, had the possibility of changing the world. And I really believed that. And I think that's, it's a critical belief for anybody involved in revolution or revolutionary work that you, you have to believe that you can change history. If enough people that you're working with also believe that, then there is that possibility of a kind of quantum move forward. And I, and I absolutely believed it. And I mean, I came up through um, before Title IX, before uh, any kind of women's studies. So, I mean, I did a, my master's thesis on uh, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, but I never really read any women. Well, there weren't any women to read, you know. So I really felt like that what I read was very, very exciting to me and sort of filled out what I thought I was like, what, what's with the whale? I, you know, like it seemed like it was really a Moby Dick <laughs> all the time. What's with the whale? What's with the whale? And so, I mean, it was just like amazing to read women. That just completely, completely turned me on. And then to meet other women who were writing that stuff or thinking that stuff was so exciting. I, I just 
you know, and it, it was personal, political, but it was also um, intellectually yeah. so exciting. I think feminism was trying to uh, always to um, empower women and men who wanted to have a different kind of relationship with each other, wanted to have a different relationship with the world. And yet, here we are, these many decades after feminisms around the world, and we still have, you know, gender inequality in, in every institution. There's in the leadership of every institution, whether it's educational, business, cultural, political, you don't have gender equality. Um, it, certainly not in the United States. I think other countries have um, legislated and produced um, some forced equality, if you will. <laughs> um, but you also have economic inequality that disproportionately affects women. Women earn less than men for the same jobs. You have violence against women, which is so pervasive, as we all know this, but I think it's important. I, I, what, what baffled me and what I try to think about in this book is why did the gay movement walk away from this set of issues, which affect 50% of its population? When I came into the LGBT movement as a young activist, you know, it was late 70s, reproductive rights, women's rights, violence against women, um, was a central part of what LGBT political activists fought about, fought for, or fought against, you know, fought to change, and as, as we also fought for our own freedom and dignity. Um, and over time, in the 80s and in the 90s, the agenda of the LGBT mainstream movement shrank. So now we're at the point where the largest um, LGBT gay rights organization will make alliances with anti-choice politicians because it's strategic. It's actually not strategic, it's tactical. You know, and, there, and, and the strategic thing to do would be to make an alliance with the women's movement to overthrow those idiots. Yeah. But that's not what we're doing. We're tactically making an alliance to win short-term victories on marriage. You quote the wonderful poet Audre Lorde, our childhood wars have aged us, but it's the absence of change which will destroy us. I mean, we have seen change, right? We have, but, but I think a, a lot of the book is about the kind of changes that we haven't seen around addressing racism and sexism within the LGBT movement and, and economic inequality. So I think Audre Lorde you know, said it so beautifully decades ago. Hmm. And she was talking about these same things. I mean, I'm just the next person saying the same thing that many leaders and activists have said before me. And the same argument, in a sense, takes place in the, in the cultural world, where a lot of people will say, well, you have gay characters on everything, you have Ellen DeGeneres, you have Kate Clinton, you have, you know, gay component to almost every successful show on TV, including the most successful. Um, so, aren't we there? Isn't your revolution realized? I think, you know, we've made uh, certainly progress with gay characters, uh, but if you don't, if a lot of times I don't feel that the characters are like representing the values that I'd really like represented. So we make this, we have the success of them being there, but it's what they say and what, you know, they're, they're sort of like, I love Modern Family. I just, it makes me howl. And I think there's some subtle changes that they're, really working in that show. So a show like that, I think, is great. Talk a bit about the decisions that you make as you put your shows together, because you're one of the few on the stand-up um, circuit that really keeps <laughs> both your identity, I mean, all of your identities on the stage, meaning the gay part, but also the political part. Mm -hmm. If you go to a Kate Clinton show, you don't just hear a lot of gay jokes mm -hmm. or lesbian jokes at all. Well, I think the, le the nice part is that there are enough lesbian comedians that I can specialize, you know, and that I can do uh, political stuff. And I think it's actually because of my, my relationship with my dear partner, who at the end of almost every show says to me, well, that was too long, but you've got to do more politics. You've said that to me forever. <laughs> so it's always been a challenge. And I, I think we're like the marriage of comedy and tragedy. I don't, and I won't say which is which, because it varies day to day, but... Um, I really feel like being with Irvishi has given me that kind of political substance that I wanted, that has an allowed me not to go into, you know, just kind of, I can't get a girlfriend joke, you know, that kind of thing. 
Um, but you have this unique quality, I think, that makes your humor is the, the way you juxtapose things that no one else would put together. And I think that makes, it's just a really quality no. of surprise. It's about um, connections and a deep understanding that is not obvious to people. So that's your underlying narrative thread in the show. I don't know, I think there's a tremendous amount of art that goes into Kate's routines. It's amazing, they're not, and, and it's made me appreciate comedy at a whole other level. Well, I was gonna say fair is it's, fair. If she needs more politics, if you tell her she needs more <laughs> politics, does she tell you you need more humor? Oh, surely our movements need more humor. Yeah, oh, we absolutely. Do. <laughs> no, I, I, yes, and I have a great sense of the absurd, which my whole family has, and so it's really made, uh, it's made it easy to be with a comedian. I love to laugh, but it, Kate has taught me to laugh more at the things that I often take far too seriously especially people who are powerful. If you laugh at the powerful, you actually undermine their authority. Laughter is a wonderful, wonderful tool um, against power. Let me end by asking each of you, I don't want to get too you know, boring about it, but if there was one thing that you think would make a major difference, either to our movements or to our society right now, that we could actually accomplish in our lifetimes? I think Folk, criminal justice uh, issues are a priority that um, are really important in the United States, but I think around the world too. Every country has its own version of it. We overcriminalize people here. We overcriminalize. We criminalize situations that shouldn't be. For example, um, HIV-positive people are burdened with unnecessary criminal laws in in I think it's now 36 states. And they criminalize things like spit or non-disclosure of one's HIV status. And I think, A, that's, not, that's a misreading of how the virus is transmitted. And, and B, it has the effect of damaging a, a set of people who are merely walking around with a virus. Um, so criminal justice policy issues, criminal ju changing, decarcerating people. Um, I'm not an abolitionist, but a lot of my friends are. I mean, and I'm open to that critique because it makes me think, whom do we need to imprison? Why do we use imprisonment? The death penalty, anti-death penalty movement in, is growing, and that's critical. So there's a lot of things in the criminal justice space that could be done that would be very valuable. Um, the second thing that I would love to see in my lifetime is actually very nerdy, and it's a shift in business schools, okay? Mm -hmm. And here's why. We're left with, at this moment, I mean, one of the differences between me as a 20-year-old and me as a 55-year-old is that I now believe that the only thing that we have is, that we can work for is socially responsible capitalism. Back then, I wanted to overthrow and abolish capitalism and replace it with socialism. Now I really believe that socially responsible capitalism is the name, contradictory though it may be, uh, that I give to the concept of what we need, uh, the double bottom line or the triple bottom line of, of valuing, you know, can we do good and make a profit? Can we make things happen that are good and beneficial for the environment, good for people who are workers, and enable whoever is the owner of the means of production to make their, you know, profits? Well, we can, but not under the current system, not under a system that allows, you know, uncontrolled accumulation and consolidation of wealth and power. So business schools are producing waves upon waves of young people who are going into these paths and running businesses. And I think if we can change the economic value system that is being taught to people who run businesses and who work in these big businesses, because I don't think that the person, I, yeah, I think we could really make a difference. The real world, the way the real world works is not so great right now. The way the real world works is, is outrageous and horrible. And, and that's why it. I think, <laughs> I, I have always felt that what we need to do and everybody should feel comfortable doing is um, we have the right to laugh. And I think that a lot of times when you're listening to somebody, I've been encouraging people to do this, when you're listening to somebody tell you the biggest pile of pookie you've ever heard, that you listen very carefully and then just go, <laughs> Oh my God, that's hilarious. Oh my God, you mean it. And I mean, I think that, that they never say those lines again with any degree of confidence. People can 
see your commentaries, the vlogs, the Kate Clinton vlogs at kateclinton.com. And find out more about your show, hashtag Kate Clinton 2014, mm -hmm. starting in Provincetown, Cape Cod this summer. And Irv, thanks so much for the most recent book. I hope you're working on another one. I am. It's uh, going to be a while, but I'm working on a book on tradition. <laughs> you're a great tradition. Let's make a tradition of this. Thanks for okay. breaking your previously existing tradition. <laughs> Kate great. Clinton, Irv Thank Shivat, thanks so much for coming. It's great having you on thanks the show. So. Thank you.